We're still looking at the question regarding, is Jesus Christ the only begotten virgin-born Son of God? And so far we've been discussing the virgin-born aspect of it. And uh, we, last week we finished up with a, an article, some, some uh, quotes from an article written back in 1992 by Andre Reznor and uh, in an article called Christmas at Matthews and how he's disparaging uh, the very idea that Mary was a virgin when, when she conceived. Rather, he was putting forth the idea that uh, it was all, con uh, she was, uh, it was raising doubts about her virginity. Okay, raising doubts about the, the fact that she, she had not known a man and, uh, <clears throat> and trying to equate that with other events in the Old Testament with some things that were, and he was bring, raising doubts about the, the uh, um, chasteness of some of the women that were in, in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And uh, um, on the one hand, the way people think in this day and age, there's always something wrong. There's always something that, that uh, and so, that, so like anybody who would have a child out of wedlock like that, well, there's got to be more to the story than the fact that, within the, the very idea that she, she had, she conceived by the Holy Spirit, well, that's so outrageous, outlandish. The very idea, okay, uh, and Tamar and the events that she, she uh, uh, transpired in her, um, uh, making it work to where her father-in-law would fulfill his obligation to her to carry on the bloodline of her husband. She, her husband had died uh, before they had child. Okay? And then the idea of Rahab, who was called a harlot, you know, whether or not she was a prostitute is debatable. Uh, there seems to be uh, uh, evidence that uh, the term harlot was used more uh, in a general term, not necessarily for a prostitute, but also men involved with... Uh, what traditionally had been men's roles, women who were uh, such as uh, keep, take keeping of an inn. Okay, other and uh, um, um, and Ruth and and uh, how she had uh, um, gained the attention and affections of of Boaz and the question he made he brought up the question of whether. <laughs> What really went down on the thresh went down on the threshing floors, you know. Did, you know, and so what sort of woman was she? What was she really doing down there, all night? Okay, of course, and that was that was the gist of the whole thing. And when it gets to the Mary, the whole idea of her being a virgin, and of course, how would Joseph feel? And of course, that we'll discuss that in a moment. Uh, how how would Joseph feel to find that his the one to whom he had been betrothed before they had gone through the wedding ceremony? that uh, she was pregnant. How in the world could he deal with this, you know, and to, to believe that, okay, really, she, she's a virgin, right? Okay, so, and he complete, concludes his thoughts. If we paid attention to the women of Matthew's genealogy, we're not entirely surprised by Mary's and Joseph's predicament. If God used those in the Messiah's family tree, thus, why wouldn't the Messiah himself come from a similar situation? In other words, why wouldn't Jesus have been born because of a, of a, a fornication? Okay, that's what he's saying. And so it's really raising doubts as to whether or not Jesus was born of a virgin or not. Okay. So at, that concluded our thoughts regarding the idea of people uh, uh, rejecting that Jesus was born of a virgin is not, uh, is not over. There are people that are still bringing this up. So let's look at some proofs, arguments for the virgin birth. That's the point. This is not about destroying our faith. This is about answering arguments against our faith. Okay. So, as we look at it, it was prophesied for centuries. No, millennia before Christ was born. What's the first virgin birth prophecy? It's up there. Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 14. Remember when after the Adam and Eve had, or, had partaken of the fruit of, knowledge, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that uh, they were um, removed from the garden. And, and uh, curses were pronounced upon each of them. Adam would, would survive by, the sweat, uh, by working hard, by the sweat of his brow. The serpent received his uh, punishment, and of course, Eve received hers too. Okay, but as we see in verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, 
and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Okay, so that I put that in there to show us God is talking now, now to the serpent who is Satan at this point. Okay, And I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is actually a prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ. That Christ being nailed on the cross, Satan may have thought he had gained the, the, the uh, victory, but all he did was bruise the heel of Christ. But Christ dealt a death blow to Satan in that he overcame death, of course, but he defeated Satan, all the works of Satan, <coughs> the works of Satan in deceiving men to sin, because in sin we find the wages of death. Okay, so, so the works of Satan is to, is to get men to sin, and when in their sin, they'll reap the benefits of death. <coughs> Christ defeated the works of Satan in defeating death and the condemnation of mankind uh, uh, because of their sins. So, whereas Christ, uh, whereas Satan bruised the heel of Christ, Christ bruised the head of Satan. Now, notice, here's what I want to point out. And I will put in between, between thy seed, speaking to Satan, and her seed. Now, here's the thing. Her seed is a, is a, it's a foreign concept. In the days this writ, written, when Moses was writing, penning this, it was the man who planted the seed in the woman. The woman didn't have a seed. But yet, this is speaking of the seed of the woman. And it's singular, okay? So, so whereas he's talking about, of course, the crucifixion, but also the fact that the woman has a seed, it's telling us that he, it is not the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman. Okay. It's implying the virgin birth. It's implying that she conceived not by normal physical means that, we, that everybody understands today, but rather it's, it's something unique, something different. Okay. <clears throat> It was prophesied, arguments for the virgin birth, centuries, okay. Now here we're getting to centuries, the 8th century B.C., Isaiah 14, 7, 14. We talked about some of this before, and this, this is a rehash. We'll go over this real fast, if we, if we, or slow, depending on what we need. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Uh, if you recall the events that the Sennacherib was coming down with his army, coming down to Jerusalem to lay siege to it, and uh, the king was frightened, in fact. He, and so God sent Isaiah to the king to tell him, look, everything's going to be okay. In fact, to let your mind be settled, you can ask any sign you want from God, and he'll provide it for you to show that, the, that Sennacherib and his army is not going to defeat you in Jerusalem. Well, the king and all his uh, uh, pride... <laughs> said, oh, I'm not going to try God. I'm not going to ask any sign. I, you know, well, as we look at, at uh, Isaiah 14. <clears throat> um, verse 4, we'll just start. This is Isaiah talking to the king. And uh, he says, that thou shalt take up his, this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor cur ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved from meat to meat. Thee at the coming of the earth of the dead of the sea, even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also come weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy veals or vials, the worm is spread unto thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning star? Art thou cut down to the ground? Actually, I'm in verse 14, chapter 14, aren't I? I need to be in chapter 7. 
He's talking about something different here. He's talking about the, the, in there. So I need to go back to Isaiah 7. I got that confused. <clears throat> okay, so as he's talking in, in Isaiah chapter 7, he's telling how Syria, Damascus, the head of Damascus is the reason. He's talking about why they're going to fail in the first opening verses. And in verse 10, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask the assigned of the Lord thy God, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Well, it's clear later that, uh, that he doesn't, it's not because of his trust and faith in God that he won't tempt the Lord, but rather uh, it's, 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 it's a ruse. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is, is it a small thing for you to worry men? But will ye worry my God also? Look, you're trying to look so pious, and you're wearying God. Is it a small matter for you to be doing this? Um, in verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. So it wasn't enough. God wanted to be sure that Ahaz knew that, that uh, the Sennacherib wasn't going to defeat them, wasn't going to destroy <coughs> uh, Jerusalem. I keep on saying Sennacherib. Um, yes. Uh, I may have been okay in this case it's not clear that it's Sennacherib but it is those they are, the armies are coming down to lay siege on Jerusalem and so as Ahaz is, re, is just saying I'm not going to tempt the Lord I'm not going to ask for a sign but God is going to make sure he understands they're not going to be defeated Ahaz has no reason to fear like he has been. So therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And he goes on to, to further in, in uh, the, the prophecy about the one that would come through the virgin. Okay, Behold a virgin. Now the focus is always on the word virgin. There are many new translations, beginning with the Revised Standard, and many that followed after who replaced this word virgin with young maiden to, to reduce the effect. The fact is, is the prophecy of the, of the uh, virgin birth of Christ. Okay. They're trying to make it, it was just like, it was just another prophecy about another woman bearing a son. A big deal. Women bear children all the time. Okay. This is nothing new. This is something that's going to be assigned to Ahaz that they're not going to be defeated. This is going to be something that, that impresses. Now, this is going to happen later, of course. Uh, that a bearing, I mean, the, the virgin birth is, is centuries later. But it would be a sign for them in that day uh, that, that, uh, that they would not be defeated or taken captive by, by the armies coming to lay siege. Now, virgin from Strong's Exhausting Accordance of the Bible version from the term 5959 in the he, his Hebrew lexicon says it's, a, it's, fem, it's, a, it's Alma. It's a feminine of, of ver, form of the, of the word 5958. It's a lass as veiled or private, a damsel, a maid, a virgin. And so that's the, the term they, they went, the general term, a maid. Okay? One who's a young woman of marrying age. And that's, the, that's what, how they, the Revised Standard Version and other versions after chose to, to uh, render it. Rather than virgin, they chose just a maiden, which is not in and of itself wrong, but it lacks the impact of what's going on here. It's a, it's a sign that God is giving Ahaz for something different. It's something that he'll know that, that, uh, uh, that they, he will not, not be captured and taken captive. Okay, so the idea is a damsel, a maid, a virgin, that's different uses. As a matter of fact, um, as we look further, um, the, the Septuagint, uh, often termed LXX, we've looked at this before too, it was translated about 200 BC, is before Christ. And if the idea that the, the uh, prophecy of 714 had nothing to do with a virgin birth, why is it that they in Alexandria who were, who were translating the Septuagint translated it Parthenos, that is the Greek term for, or Parthenos, 
the Greek term for virgin, not merely a young maiden, okay? Uh, if you look at the idea, a young maiden who's mar of marrying age who isn't married, what's she going to be? Well, she's chaste, she's going to be a virgin. Okay, it's understood. Even that term they use, if, they, if you understand it, would, it, would imply she's a virgin. But they chose, the, 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 the translators of the Septuagint, about 200 BC, translated that, and the, the Septuagint is a Greek translation from the Hebrew. So they had the Old Testament text in Greek, and translators chose the word parthenos instead of another term. It was more specific about a virgin, okay? Not merely it. So, so this is before any accusations were made that, oh, that this is not about a virgin birth. This is just a general birth. But here's, here are some problems with that we'll look at. Uh, the New Testament, some other arguments about the virgin birth. We'll look at this again in a, in a moment, um, or more pointedly. But the New Testament records that fulfill Isaiah 7, 14, declaring that he was born of a virgin. And that's the other aspect of it. Are the, are the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit? Are they profitable for reproof? Okay, they're profitable. All scriptures inspired of God. All scriptures inspired of God. Okay, it's God breathed. You know, uh, for uh, scripture is not a matter of one's own private interpretation, but uh, they spake not. Um, oh man, I missed this up. <laughs> Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how we got the Bible. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, they were born alone. Okay, so. As we look at this, that the New Testament itself also was inspired by the Holy Spirit, that uh, Matthew 1.18 beginning, what's the scripture? You can turn to Matthew and just follow along here. I've got this on the uh, overhead right now. But Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then... Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So the first thoughts of Joseph are, yes, she was involved in fornication. And he was not going to uh, uh, mar uh, go through the final, the marriage feast, what finalizes their marriage. And so they, were, she was still, they still had not come together and, and, uh, physically. And so Joseph had suspicions about what had happened. Okay, so he was going to put her away. It tells you what kind of man Joseph was. <coughs> Rather, having put her to public shame, put Mary to public shame, he was going to put her away quietly and just let her go, pass at that. And, but, as we see, he was minded to put her away privily, but while he, he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It's interesting that the term Jesus, if we look at the, uh, where did I see the term? Jesus is Yeshua, which is Joshua. Jesus is Joshua, their saviors. Joshua is the savior of his people in that sense, but Jesus is the savior of the world. Okay. And uh, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, note this in bold. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay. So this was showing the fulfillment of the prophecy of the birth of Christ that behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. So the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 was that of a virgin birth and not just a, another woman having another child. This was specifically about the virgin birth and this, this uh, emphasizes that it was a prophecy about the virgin birth inspired by the Holy Spirit written by the uh, Apostle Matthew. Matthew. Um, and they should call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Now, version from the Greek and Strong's 
is term number 3933, Parthenos, or Parthenos, of unknown origin. It's a maiden, by implication, an unmarried daughter, a virgin. Okay. So that's how they rendered it, uh, as, as a virgin. Now, um, let's see how much we are. Let's consider the witnesses for this fact, that she was born of a virgin. Consider the witness regarding the rendering virgin. Isaiah himself, who was the one who made the prophecy. He was uh, held in high esteem among all Old Testament prophets. He was. Isaiah the prophet was one that was often quoted. He was a statesman prophet. Okay? He was a premier prophet. He was the messianic prophet of the Old Testament. Um, I think it's Isaiah. If it, uh, so many, and you look at it, it's not just that of the virgin birth. It's many other prophecies about Christ's life, his crucifixion on the cross, his suffering, his vicarious death, his suffering and the, the crucifixion. Um, Isaiah 53 is talking about all the suffering he went through. Now here's the thing. Of all the prophecies regarding Christ, if we would re accept them, like the suffering on the cross and everything, why would we not accept the fact that he was born of a virgin? If we reject one, why would we re uh, accept any of the others? Um, <clears throat> so you consider, is, uh, did Isaiah lie? You know, Matthew. The inspired writer of this account. Did he make a mistake having been inspired by the Holy Spirit? Was he wrong? Did he mistakenly use the word virgin instead of young maiden? It's in the, we're in the Greek. The, the term parthenos is very specific. There's another term. I don't know what it is right now. It's, it's, it's more of a young maiden. Or rather, it is a, a, just a general term for a woman, young woman. But that's not the word he chose. He, he chose the word uh, Parthenos, which is virgin. Did he mistakenly use that term? Did Matthew embellish it? Did he lie about the events? The story, did he? That's what, what the, the, the Andre Reznor, what he, what he was writing about, that's what he's implying. Matthew lied about the whole thing. But, Matthew lied. Hmm? But believing the virgin birth is no different than believing Okay. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's one difference. I know what you're saying. There's one where you say, like, you're talking about the Big Bang and the universe came to existence, and this happened four and a half billion years ago? No, 14 billion years ago? Yeah, they keep on getting bigger and bigger to make more time. See, time is the magical element that enables all things to happen, regardless of the plausibility or probability of their occurring. And... Uh, Um, but the idea that scientific method is observing the natural universe for repeated events so that we can predict uh, how things happen. We can predict what would happen, but they have to be repeated events. And we do that all the time. Thomas Edison, of the many thousands of experiments he ran to try to invent the incandescent light bulb, he failed many times, but yet by using the uh, scientific method, he came to, finally came to an, uh, a material that would render the, uh, the electric light bulb. We look at uh, gravity. Sir Isaac Newton was, def I say he, he didn't invent gravity. He discovered it, but I think we were all living with gravity all this time. We just hadn't defined it specifically. And, and so as you look at the universe, acceleration under gravity, all these things, we can send probes to Mars because of the repeatability of the, na the, the natural universe. That's science. But um, <clears throat> um, one-time events that no one is around to, to observe, that's not science. Okay, that's speculation. And, I, I, and as hard as men may try by 
un by using natural laws that they understand and trying to e extrapolate back to a time where no one was to say this is how the universe came to being, that's not science. It's, it's still speculation just as anybody. And like you said, believing that is just the same as believing that God said, uh, let there be light. But there is one difference. And here's the difference. The idea that, that men say that, that uh, the universe came because of an of, of a initial explosion and everything came into being from, <coughs> from that, that's the speculation of men. But the one who created it all has told us how he did it and that he said, let there be light. He, said, he told us how he did it. Well, he told us the chain of events. Of course, he didn't go into all the detail about the, uh, the structure of the atoms and the, the subatomic particles and the, and the laws of nature he put in place. He didn't tell us about that. That's not the important thing. The important thing he wanted us to know is that he did it. He created it in six literal days. And there's, uh, uh, and so that the this difference is between believing the Big Bang and believing creation by God is that God told us how he did it. And that's the big difference. Whereas the Big Bang, there's no authority behind that. But if they want to believe that, then you, that's, I think that's what you're trying to do. Like what, how, what? If you can turn it on them, you're willing to believe something that had no witnesses to it, none. Yeah. Well, like, like you say, you know, as regard to like what we discussed in the, in, the, in the worship this morning, there were eyewitnesses to the events there and the accounts given by intelligent intel, uh, uh, men of integrity. And that's, and that's uh, they were there in, in place. You know, there's no better account that can be given but by those that were there. In the case of the creation, that's a different case in point in that God told Moses, this is what I did. And so that's a case where we rely upon our belief that the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write what he did. And the Holy Spirit being there. God yeah. His own yeah. He saw it happen. Yeah. He told him what happened. Like if I saw something happen, mm -hmm. and I told you. Right, right. I'm the witness. I mm -hmm. saw it. And I wasn't there to, to but say if it. If you're the scribe and the one writing down mm -hmm. my, what my testimony or my, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I'm, I'm giving to you. Mm -hmm. as yeah. Yeah. So, if the book of Genesis were the only one ever written, okay, the only inspired word of God ever written, just that account would leave us some question. It would. But the fact that you have a multitude of other recorded events, a multitude of other uh, uh, events of, uh, that God told this man to, to say this and do that, and that God gave this prophecy to this man and centuries later it came to pass well that's something different I mean you know we can, we can open our Bibles and uh, the good majority of it is the Old Testament and the events that God brought to pass based and, and they fulfilled every bit of them well all of a sudden our rely our our faith in the first account that was given to Moses is much greater because of all the other stuff that is written that proves that this came from God. Okay. All right. So, as we consider... Uh, so there, I don't know. I guess I see a lot of this as men trying to make the virgin birth something that wasn't miraculous. And it was. Right. Right. I mean, it, it wasn't natural. And, the, the, and that's what I brought up last week was that, okay, what about the creation? Was that miraculous? Pretty much. What about uh, the flood? <coughs> Was that miraculous? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the parting of the Red Sea, where they walked on dry land through the Red Sea and not the Reed Sea? Okay. Yeah, that was miraculous. Uh, and a multitude of others. The walls of Jericho falling down. That's miraculous. Everything. And the virgin birth is miraculous, too. So if you reject the virgin birth, why that? and yet accept all the other stuff. Okay. Or, of course, you go to the, the end. If you reject the one, you have to reject the rest. 
Yes, Adam. Okay. Uh. <coughs> Luke chapter 3. Let me see how it go here. What about Mary herself? What about Mary? Luke chapter 1, I'm sorry. Luke chapter 1. What about Mary? Luke, of course, he's a physician. He's a Gentile, and yet he believed the gospel, and he was inspired to write the, account, the gospel account according to Luke and the, the book of Acts. And if you look at chapter 1, Luke writes about the events, uh, in verses 26 and following, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. That's another witness. The angel Gabriel himself, an angel of God. Yes, Adam? Okay. Okay. So, so if you look at so as we look at this, Mary herself, as a witness, as you're either going to believe what's written here or not. And if you if you don't believe this, then it doesn't matter. Whatever you read here, what what are we doing here today if we don't believe this? If you don't believe that what what this, what these men wrote. What are we doing here? It's like when, when Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about if, if Christ was not resurrected, what are we doing? Not only are we wasting our time because we're still in our sins, but we're liars. We're preaching a falsehood about God. So if we don't believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we're wasting our time. We're a bunch of liars and hypocrites or, or, or we're deluded. Same way with here. If we don't believe what we're reading in, in the book of Luke, then why believe any of it? We're wasting our time. So as we consider this, the angel Gabriel himself was a witness because he announced to, to Mary that uh, she would, uh, was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin to spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin na virgin's name <coughs> was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of situation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Uh, you think her lifestyle has anything to do with finding favor with God? So, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So Mary, you're ready to get married, and you're going to deliver a, a boy child, and you're going to name him Jesus. It says, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over thee, the house of Jacob. Uh, <coughs> forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. We can go back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 24, to see what he's talking about. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know no man? I know not a man. She's had no relations with any, any man. And yet, so the obvious question is, how is this going to happen? You're, we're familiar with Elizabeth, who was told by the angel she would conceive. Rather, he was, she was, rather, it was her husband, Zechariah. 
And of course, this was conception by the agency of a man. But it was miraculous in the sense that they were too old. Okay, but here we have a woman, a young woman, who will conceive not knowing any man. Uh, and verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, I, I, yeah, Elizabeth, pardon me, she had also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Do you realize the problem she was going to enter into now? She said, What you have said, let it happen to me. She's opening up her life to, here she was having a child out of wedlock. <clears throat> and so her attitude was, let it happen. Let, let God do unto me as according to his will. And so, um, of course, there were some who questioned, even Joseph questioned it, but he was told by the angel, by a vision, that uh, that was conceived in her, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Okay, but there are other aspects. As these things happen, and events trans, uh, transpired regarding her, Jesus, she kept these things in her memory, pondered them. Okay, as you consider, so who gave testimony to this? Did Luke have supernatural understanding that Jesus was born a virgin? That all these events transpired, possibly, but I think more accurately. He investigated. He was inspired to write this, indeed, and what he wrote was was accurate to the in, to the T. Okay, but he still had to investigate. As you look in Acts chapter one, he set forth those things. He investigated for Theophilus. Okay, so as he wrote, he investigated. He learned, and so he must have interviewed people, and I imagine may have interviewed Mary about what what happened. Okay, so as you consider the testimony, the the witness of Mary. The witness of Joseph, who, having received that, that vision, he had no reason to make this up. He was going to put her away quietly. He didn't have to marry her. She was with child. He knew that. He didn't have to marry her, but yet he did. Out of a good heart? No, he was reassured that this was not because of fornication. Reassured by an angel of God. Reassured by this vision that he had received in his, in his dream. So it doesn't make sense. Joseph is another witness for the events because he had no reason. If Why would he? Why would he marry her in spite of the fact that he was, she was found with a child? If this were normal, why would he? But this was not. This was a miracle. Okay. Um, of course, when we look at Joseph himself, the scripture of Matthew 1, 19 through 25, is talking about the vision that Joseph received. We just discussed that. And so that's, well, this is just beginning the witnesses about those that Jesus was born of the, of the, of the virgin. Okay. And so um, we'll continue on next week with, with this. <coughs> Right. That's absolutely right. Absolutely right. If you don't believe that in the virgin birth, you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's what it really comes down to. Thanks. Yes, yes Mary. Last verse was uh, Matthew 1, the verses that talk about, uh, let me see if I still have this. Yeah. Um, Matthew 1, 19 through 25. Thanks for your attention and your comments.